the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. I'll tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and get down on my knees and pray as we go before the Lord. I want to ask if you would join me and let's stand as we go before the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you in this place, Lord, and we are just so grateful for the opportunity to come into the house of the Lord and to hear your word. Father, we thank you that we don't come into this place to hear from a man or to hear from a woman, Father, or to hear from a band, but Lord, we come into this place to hear from and experience you, Lord, and we give you the praise and the glory and the honor in this house, Father. We ask that you would just be amongst us, that your presence would be in this room tonight, Father. We thank you that you would anoint us, God, to open our ears, to hear the word in our eyes, to see, Father, what you have caused us to see tonight, Lord, that we might look into ourselves and see, Father, what it is that you've had for us tonight, Lord. And we think that we can leave this place strengthened. We can leave this place better equipped to go into the highways and the byways into all the world, Father, and preach the gospel, Father. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor, Lord. We ask that your presence would be amongst all the other churches in the Southern California, as well as across the world that are delivering the messages, Father. We thank you that we don't see ourselves as better than anybody else, but, Father, but as co-laborers in the body of Christ. And we just give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. Well, praise God. I'll tell you what, I'm excited excited to bring a message tonight because it is something that I think that we're going to have fun. I, I believe it's going to challenge you. You guys ready to be challenged? You guys ready to kind of take a gander, take a look on the inside and let's see what we can come up with and let's take a look to see if any of these apply to you. I'm sure they're not, but let's just take a look inside anyways, okay? You know, as the, as the young adults pastor, one of the things I like to do with the, with the young adults is, um, is, is, is to compare and contrast, I guess it's one of those things that I picked up while I was in university some years ago, is I always seem to have to compare and contrast this or that. You know, look at this versus look at that and, and you know, make the lists and write a, write a paper based on this and then write the argument based on that and so forth and so on. So I thought it'd be fun tonight to take a little bit of a, of a comparison between two subjects, between two topics that you hear very much so in the church within our own lives. But I'm going to present to you two words and we're going to take a look at those as far as what Jesus has to say and also what the Bible has to say about some of these words. And I'll tell you what, we could compare and contrast these two topics for years. You know, the, the, the centuries of, of, of Christendom, as far as it goes, is the, the millennium, really, of, 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 our, of our religion, of our faith, you know, has, has covered so many topics and, and, and so many areas of these two words that we could honestly spend years. But I've, I've, got, I've got a couple good points for you tonight, and I think that if each and every one of us open up our ears, open up our eyes, and open up our hearts to understand and to genuinely look into these things and, and, and look upon ourselves and say, you know, what are we doing? Are we operating in this or are we operating in that? I believe that we can better equip ourselves, better realize what it is that we're doing and how effective we can be in the kingdom of God. Because, you know, it's, often, it's, it's, it's good for us, you know, as, 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 as you read the, uh, the, the, the word about the, Paul the Apostle as he's uh, quoting the communion in, in the book of Corinthians, you know, Paul the Apostle says it's good for a man to examine himself. It's good for a man to judge himself. That way he might not be judged. And I want to encourage you tonight not to necessarily to judge yourself, but to be open-minded, to look at these words, to hear what we're talking about tonight, and look upon yourself, you know, because I think Honestly, we could all look back at our lives, maybe in the current situation that we're in, or maybe in the past, or maybe sometimes we can know that there's some things in our lives that maybe spur us to act in one way or the other. But I want to take a look. One of them I believe is good. One of them I believe is not so good. And I believe that we all have the opportunity to act in both, but there's one that's better than the other, I believe. And so you're probably wondering, gosh, Pastor Luke, could you get to the words already? Because I want to know what you're talking about. So tonight, I've got two words for you tonight. We're going to talk about the title of the message. is called Religious or relationship. Right. Hello. You know, I want to look at the comparison between religion and personal relationship. Now, the term religion can get us into trouble. Now, religion on itself, let's be honest, religion to the heart of things is not a bad thing. As a matter of fact, the, uh, in, the, in the gospel, or, or not in the gospel, in the Bible, James himself tells us that. In the, James, the first chapter, in the 27th verse, I'll just go ahead and put it up on you, on the overhead, James himself defines it. He says, pure and undefiled religion. Before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. But you know that pure and undefiled religion means that there is sometimes unpure and defiled 
religion. And you know that term. We've all heard that term, religion, used not just necessarily in the positive, but also in the negative. You know, you can talk to somebody or you can hear from somebody and you say, man, that's a very religious person. And tonight, I don't want to talk about when I say religion, when I speak about religion, before we get into tonight, I want to make sure that each and every one of you understand what we're talking about when I say religion. I'm not talking about uh, the Catholic Church or or the Baptist Church. I'm not talking about organized religion. I'm not talking about these guys over here or this group over there or this different belief system over there. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about religion based on your and my personal life and relationship based on your and my personal life. You can define the term religion as far as the modern vernacular of how we say things. Sometimes you can even define it as legalism. Religious person, maybe so much more than not just here because, you know, you want to get from God, but rather because it's tradition, because it's what your, your, your wife brought you here, your husband brought you here, your parents brought you here, or you're serving God because that's the thing that your family told you to do. Religion based upon actions on the outside. And we're going to take a look at a compare and a contrast between religion and relationship. Are you guys with me tonight? You guys kind of get what I'm talking about. So I want you to understand that I'm not talking about religion from this, religion from that, okay? Because I'm not touching that tonight. That's not where we're going. I want to talk about each and every one of our individual lives, whether or not we're living in religion or we're living in relationship. And I hope by the, by the end of tonight, you'll understand the difference between a relationship speaking of relationship with God, with Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, or religion based upon God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. I remember one time we had a guest speaker, and he defined, uh, he gave us a visual illustration, and I'm going to go ahead and put it up on the overhead. There's a, there's a, a visual illustration of, 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 of a farm road. You know, my, parents, my grandparents live in, in Washington, and when, when we drive to their house in Washington, as they live off the freeway, they live in farmland. They live in potato farming areas and so forth like that. There's narrow roads where the tractors drive down. On each side of that road is a ditch. They fill that ditch with water to flood and to irrigate that field. So on both sides of this road is a 10 foot ditch on one side and a 10 foot ditch on the other side. It's actually kind of nerve wracking to drive because oftentimes the roads are narrow and and when two cars come together you kind of wonder man if I if I go over here and I get into that ditch there's no way I'm going to get out. Now I put a picture up there for you because we're Southern Californians. We live in San Bernardino. Okay there's not very many farmlands other than that one right there on California Street and so some of you might know not know what a ditch on the side of the road looks like. I'm not talking about a curb. I'm talking about a ditch. And I remember this one speaker, he defined her, he gave us this visual illustration as, you know, Jesus says that narrow is the gate leading in, into, into heaven. And, you know, and he says broad is the way so many people take the easy road. And, and narrow is that road, that path that we take. And on, on that path, there's a ditch on each side of that road. And oftentimes that ditch on one side, you could say is religion, legalism, the law. You know, you get so tied up on, uh, on doing things this way, that way, this way, that way, that yet you forget the other thing. And the other side of the ditch goes to the side of grace. And you say, well, Pastor Luke, how is grace a ditch? Grace isn't a ditch. God's grace is, is, is sufficient for us. God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on our behalf is no, by, by no means a ditch. But when we live in the ditch of God's grace and we keep saying, oh, I'm just a sinner in need of a Savior, then all of a sudden we find ourselves not traveling that narrow road, but rather driving in that ditch. Because, you know, let me tell you something. God's grace enables us to get out of sin. God's grace does not enable us to stay in sin. So today, when I'm talking about religion versus relationship, I want you to understand that I don't want to go to one side of that ditch, to that, to that muddy water on one side, and jump to the other side, but rather for us to carry on to that narrow pathway, that straight and narrow way that Jesus Christ talked about in the book of Matthew, so that we can continue on and we can be who God has called us to be, so that we can be all that God has asked to do, be, to do and that we can be effective ministers. Because you know what? It's not just about Pastor Luke, Pastor Jim, Pastor Dan, Pastor Deborah up on here on the stage. Each and every one of us, each and every one of you out there are full-time ministers. As a matter of fact, it's up to you guys to go out to the highways and the byways, to your workplaces, to your jobs, to your families, to your friends, and to reach those that maybe couldn't be reached otherwise. We all are in this together. It's not just about coming in this place and hearing somebody speak and then leaving and and operating your daily life as it was. That's called religion. So we're going to talk about religion versus relationship with Jesus Christ, with 
with God the Father, with the Holy Spirit. You guys with me tonight? Yeah. So we're going to take a look at them. I don't have numbered points, but we've got a couple topics. We've got a couple things. So if you're taking notes, you can just write down. We're going to look at religion first. We're going to look at the, the example in the Bible, talk about it a little bit, and then we're going to compare, compare and contrast and take the opposite of that and look at the relationship with God and the inside, the heart matters, and look at that, okay? So we're going to go from religion to relationship to religion to relationship to religion to relationship. So that way you guys know the direction that we're going tonight. You got it? You guys understand? Okay, you guys ready to dig in? Let's get into the word of the Lord tonight. Talking about religion or relationship. If you guys got your Bibles, let's turn to Matthew, the 23rd chapter. We're going to kind of be ping-ponging around the New Testament and the book of Matthew and the book of Luke as we hear about Jesus. Because I think that there's no better example of speaking about religion as far as legalism, as far as operating things, you know, uh, as far as, you know, uh, operating in the law, operating in, 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 our, in, in our own flesh as far as what we think things should be versus how God says they are. I think that there's no better example than Jesus Christ and the scribes and the Pharisees. I mean, all throughout the New Testament, Jesus gives us examples. As a matter of fact, like I said, we could spend years on this very topic, Matthew, the 23rd chapter chapter is pretty much all about this. And, you know, I think it's, it's great. You know, if you think about it, well, Pastor Luke, what is this pertaining? You know, I, I'm not a religious person. I've been set free from religion. I operate in, in the grace of God. I live and I know that, you know, I shouldn't be legalistic. But you know what the bottom line is? is I think that we all can say at some point in our lives, we've been guilty of it. Whether you say, oh, Pastor Luke, not me. No, 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 not me. Probably right there you're saying it. But the bottom line is that sometimes, you know, I can say, you know, listen, I'm not perfect. But I, I, I can say that I've looked at, at somebody else and seen that maybe they've been operating in something that I, you know, I didn't agree with or something like that. And I start to judge them. Psh, man, all of a sudden God comes out of me. He's like, hey, what about you? And it's like, oh, yeah, all right, okay, yeah, religion. So we, have the, we all have probably operated this in some way or another. Some of us may be longer than others. But tonight I hope that we can encourage you to take a look at our lives, to take a look at our actions, to take a look at what the Word of God says and act upon that so that we might examine ourselves, watch how we act, watch how we think, watch how we live so that we might live in a relationship with Jesus Christ rather than religion. So it's Matthew in the 23rd chapter here. Jesus is speaking in the, 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 the 22nd, 23rd chapter. Jesus is, is going about, he's preaching in the Pharisees. Man, they're just putting him to the test. They're just trying to, trying to trick him. They're trying to get things to him. They're trying to talk to him about taxes and all this stuff. And so, you know, Jesus just, here it is, man. In the 23rd chapter, Jesus just starts laying into him. You know, it's kind of fun. It's kind of fun to read. You know, I mean, I can imagine that he's, he's probably, you know, had it about up to here with the tests, with them watching him, with them doing all these things, with all these trials. He's like, come on, guys, don't you get it? So here in Matthew, the 23rd chapter, we're going to talk about religion first. And, and, and looking at religion, the first thing for tonight is religion is about the external, the outside. Religion is about, is about the outside. Jesus Christ, Matthew, the 23rd chapter and the 25th verse. Jesus is writing or speaking to the scribes and says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but the inside are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Religion. Here's the Pharisees. Here's the religious leaders of the time. They've got their, their robes on and they're walking about the streets. If you can imagine with their shoulders pressed back with their, with their chins and their noses in the air because they know that they're of, 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 a, of a certain bloodline and they know that they're of a certain study or stature. And so they know, they have that attitude that they're better than, than these and than that. And they know that, that you know, there's, there's certain things that are placed upon them and certain rights and, and, and prestige placed upon them. And, and here Jesus comes to them and he says, listen... But listen to you guys. He says, woe to you, Pharisees and scribes, you hypocrites. Hello. He says, man, you, you, you clean the plate. You clean the cup on the outside. And on the inside, it's full of extortion and self-indulgence. You don't take care of what's on the inside. You only care about what's on the outside, what's present. You know, I have this coffee cup. My technical director in the control room tonight, he'll laugh when he hears this because I have this coffee cup. It's my coffee cup. You know, I bring it to work. I have it at work. It is my cup. I drink out of it every day. And on Sundays, I sip coffee while I'm in the control room on Sunday mornings as I'm directing or doing graphics. All throughout the day, I sip coffee. Well, it just so happens that I usually don't finish that cup, you know, by the end of the day. And what happens is I'll leave that cup probably right there at that computer. And we'll come back into the control room on Wednesday. And there will be that coffee cup. And at this time, all the water in the coffee has evaporated from that cup. And now all that's left is that black 
you know, nasty sludge, because I drink my coffee black. I don't put none of that cream and sugar stuff in my coffee. So all of a sudden, you look at this cup, and it's just nasty black sludge, and you go to pick it up and look at it, it's like, whoa. Well, Jesus Christ is saying, listen, man, if you're all about religion, if you're all about on the outside, how, do, how is it that you are appearing to somebody else? How is it that you are showing off your outside? He says, look at man, the inside is full of self-indulgence and, and extor- extortions. Our insides, if we're based on religion, if we're only out for, for what, what it might appear it's on the outside that we, might, what, what, that we might come off as, Jesus says, listen, man, on the inside, you're rotting away. Like that coffee cup. There's nothing. I'm not going to go pour new coffee into that dirty, nasty, dried up coffee sludge. Because guess what, guys? It's going to taste rank. So Jesus Christ is saying to the scribes and Pharisees, he says, listen, man, religion is based on the external. Religion is based on the outside. When you operate in legalism, when you operate in the law, when you operate based on, on, on rules and regulations and not upon the relationship of God, it is based on the outside of your life, not on the inside. Now let's take a look at the, 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 the comparison to that. Are you guys with me tonight? Relationship, obviously, then is based upon the internal. The internal relationship is based about the internal, the inside of a person. Jesus Christ in that same chapter, continuing on, in the 26th verse, Jesus Christ says, Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and the dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. A relationship with God, when you focus upon your relationship with Jesus Christ and rather appearing on what what, what comes on the outside appearance, when you cleanse the inside through the blood of Jesus Christ, that so great a salvation that we have been given through Jesus Christ, when you focus upon him and you develop that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, let me tell you something, the inside becomes cleansed. And because the inside is cleansed, the outside is clean as well. Because it starts from the inside out. Jesus Christ says in the, in the book of Matthew, he says, listen, man, you will know them. He's also speaking right there while he's teaching to his disciples. He's talking about Pharisees. He says, you will know them by their fruit. Us and the young adults, we've been doing a study in John the 15th chapter, and Jesus is talking about the vine. And we started talking about the fruit of a vine. And Jesus says, you know, if you abide in me and I need you, you'll bear much fruit. What is fruit? Fruit is the DNA of that particular plant. It is, the, it is the external evidence of the inside genetics of that plant. Jesus Christ says in the book of Matthew, in the seventh chapter, he says, listen, man, a bad tree can't bear good fruit, a good tree can't bear bad fruit. He says, you know, uh, uh, grapes don't bear thorns and, 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 and thistles bear, you know, oranges. I paraphrase that. I added my own fruits. <laughs> the bottom line is, is that, listen, if our DNA, if on the inside of the plant is good, we will bear good fruit. If the inside is rotten, if the inside is, is gangrenous, if the inside is dirty and funky, but we're washing the outside of that plant, let me tell you something, it's not going to bear any fruit or it's going to bear bad, rotten fruit. And I'll tell you what, the outside will show what the inside has. Based upon the relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, when we grab a hold, when Jesus Christ said in John the 15th chapter, he says, if you abide in the vine, then you will bear much fruit. Abide in me and I in you, and you will bear fruit. That is the DNA of us. When we abide in Jesus Christ, when we abide in his love, as he says in John the 15th chapter, all of a sudden that begins to consume us, that we take on the DNA of that plant. We get the source from the roots of that vine, that vine being Jesus Christ, the vine keeper being God himself, and he's tending to us, and he says, listen, I'm going to make it so that you bear fruit, and your fruit will be good. Why? Because the inside Because that relationship, because we are grafted into that vine, we are planted into them, because we are not focusing on the outside. Because let me tell you something. When a good tree bears fruit, it's going to be good fruit. When the inside, when we plant our hearts upon Jesus Christ, when we fix our eyes, when we fix our hearts upon a relationship with him, let me tell you something, everything else begins to fall into place. And we don't have to worry about looking good on the outside because now all of a sudden we got royalty on the outside from the inside out. You guys with me tonight? We're talking about Religious or relationships. You guys ready to compare another one? Religion seeks the approval of man. Now you say, Pastor Luke, that's kind of similar to what you just said. Religion is about the external. But religion is about, religion of speaking about the external is about a person being based upon their outside. Now we're going to not just based upon how we are, but seeking the approval 
of somebody else. You've heard that term, you know, misery loves company. Man loves approval. We like to look good. When I put my shirt on tonight, I ask my wife, do I match? Do I look okay? She's like, baby, you look good. I'm like, thank you. Approval. We want that based on the outside. That's our nature. Religion seeks the approval of man. And here, if you've got your Bibles, we're going to ping pong a little bit around now into the, into the book of Matthew. We're going to go back now to Matthew, the sixth chapter. So just turn a couple pages back. Religion seeks the approval of man. Here Jesus is preaching his Sermon on the Mount. Just finished talking about prayer. Now he's talking about fasting in Matthew, the sixth chapter. 17th verse, here he's saying, he says, but when you fast... I'm sorry, the 16th chapter, 16th verse first. Moreover, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites. Oh, that's that word again. Hypocrites. With sad countenance, they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they will have their reward. Religion is based upon it seeks the, the, the approval of men. So here you can imagine Jesus talking about hypocrites, the scribes, the Pharisees, those who are fasting. And he says, listen, you can see those guys. They're out on the street corner in their righteous clothing. And they're sucking in their cheeks. <laughs> Rolling their eyes. Oh, so hungry. <laughs> Jesus says, yeah, man, you know, when you're doing that, hey. Somebody's going to come, oh, righteous brother, God bless you. You are so holy. Listen, I'll be honest with you. I have gone through fasts before, and I have done that. You know, people say, oh, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing real good. <laughs> I'm just living off chicken broth. <laughs> so that somebody might tap me on the back or pat me on the back and say, oh, man, praise God, God's going to touch you in that fast. Jesus Christ says, listen, man, they're going to have their reward. Why? Because guess what? They sought the approval of man. So, okay, great. You get the approval of man. So what? What's the reward in that? What's the good in that? What, does, what comes out of that? Religion is based upon. Or religion seeks the approval of man. But we're talking about religion versus relationship. So let's go on in that same chapter in, those, in the next verses to relationship. Relationships seek the approval of God. Now we're talking about the heart. Who, what does it matter? Who does it matter? Who are you trying to impress? You trying to impress that person next to you? <gasps> Holier than thou, suck that stomach in and bring those cheeks in? It's January, right? So it's like the fasting month. Everybody fasts for January. So come February, all of us are, you know, sucking our cheeks in and, 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 and acting all weak and tired. Well, sure, great, we get, that, we get that approval. Oh, man, I lost 10 pounds on my fast. Great. Wonderful, pat on the back. Or do we do it for the heart? Do we do it so that God would speak to us? Do we take those things that we need, those things that we desire, those things that we want, and replace them? Because listen, guys, a fast isn't just about going without. You're supposed to, when, you, when you're hungry, if you fast food, when you're hungry, focus upon God. So that God could be your sustenance. If you fast, like, you know, uh, 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 your phone or your games, when you want to play your games, you're supposed to dedicate that time that you spend on your phone reading your word because it's about the heart. So when we base it upon a relationship with God, with Jesus Christ, now all of a sudden that fast isn't about how much, get, how much weight we lost, about how righteous we can be or how righteous we can appear like he says the Pharisees and the hypocrites do, but rather so that we can dig closer, dig deeper into the things of God so that we can hear the, the voice of God in our life. We can get direction, answers for tough questions in our life because now all of a sudden we've sought after God. We've sought after the things of God. I remember there's a story. When, when the, the disciples went out to cast a demon out of this man and they couldn't do it. Jesus comes and he casts a demon out of the man. And the disciples say, Father, Jesus, what, what, what happened? Why couldn't we do it? He says, don't you know that this can only be done through prayer and fasting? Why? It's not about religion. It's not because you said abracadabra, Jesus Christ, oh, oh in the name of Jesus but rather because you have a personal relationship. Not only do you know the name of the person that you're speaking about, but you know that person because now you've got a relationship with them. Let's see what Jesus Christ says in Matthew, the sixth chapter. 
He says in the verse, in, 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 in the 17th and 18th verse, he says, but when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. Take a shower, yo. Okay, I added that. That's my translation. So that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your father who is in secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. This isn't the first time Jesus presents this idea. It's just as a matter of fact, a few verses before that, Jesus is talking about prayer. And he says, listen, and when you pray, don't use idle repetitions and vain mumblings like the hypocrites do. He says, go into your closet and pray to God in secret. Why? Because it's not about words. It's not about standing on the street shouting your prayer out so that everybody can hear you and say, wow, that's a righteous, that's a holy person. But rather, it's about the heart. It's about the relationship saying, God, I need you. God, speak to me. God, come to me. God, I want to get more of you. God, your word says that when I draw near to you, you will draw near to me. And I don't care about man, but I would rather have your approval. Religion versus relationship. You guys with me tonight? You guys getting into this? You guys having a good time? Hopefully examine ourselves saying, you know, do I operate in this or do I operate in that? Am I looking for what people think about me? Do I care? Because maybe if we care about what people think about us too much, then maybe we're operating in religion instead of operating the relationship that Jesus Christ has asked us to. Hello. Woo. Drove that one home. We're talking about religion versus relationship. The next one tonight. This one's a big one, man. This one's deep. This one we can spend hours on, but we don't have hours. Religion lowers God to man. What does that mean? Religion takes God and brings him to our level. In the book of Matthew, the 16th chapter, if you've got your Bibles, let's turn there. You say, Pastor Luke, I don't, don't quite understand what you're saying on this. Let me show you. Let me tell you, because this one is deep. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Fifth verse. I love this chapter. If you ever want to be encouraged by maybe not getting things on the first try, read Matthew, the 16th chapter. Because this is a conversation that Jesus has with his disciples. And it's funny. Because they don't get it. And then they get it. And then Jesus has a conversation with Peter. And he gets it. But then he doesn't get it. So I'll tell you what. If you ever feel like you're just having a hard time, read Matthew, the 16th chapter. You'll feel better. Because if you know those guys that were with Jesus all day, all night, they, they can miss it. We can too. And, but you know what? He gives them the answers. In Matthew, the 16th chapter, here Jesus Christ has fed the, the multitudes. They've gotten on the boat, gone to the other side of the sea. The disciples realize, oh, we forgot to bring bread. Oops, we got nothing to eat. Now Jesus Christ has already fed the multitude. He's already broken the bread. He's already broken the loaves, or you know, the, the loaves of, of bread and the fish, and he's fed the multitudes. Now they've gone over and the disciples have, you know, they forgot about the bread. I love Pastor Dan talked about this a few months ago, or actually just uh, about a couple months ago, about the hardening of the heart. And if you didn't hear that message, you ought to hear it because that's a great point. I'm not going to devil too much in that, you know. But here we go in Matthew, the 16th chapter. The disciples have one loaf of bread. And Jesus begins to speak to them in the 16th chapter in the 5th verse. Jesus says to them, Now when his disciples came to the other side... They had forgotten to take bread, verse number six. And Jesus said to them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, it's because we have no bread. So here Jesus has just made bread out of nothing. And the Bible tells us in Matthew that everybody ate as much as they want. So it wasn't that he took the loaves and the fish and he broke maybe a crumb here and there. They had as much as they want, and then they took the leftovers. So clearly the disciples have seen the power of Jesus when it comes to bread, right? So now Jesus tells them, beware of the leaven, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they say, what is he talking about? What is he talking about? He's talking about, we didn't bring any bread. <laughs> He's mad, we didn't bring no bread. And they begin to reason amongst themselves. Religion brings God down to our level. Let me tell you like this. We are finite beings. We have a beginning. We have an end. You know what? Scientifically, I guess we don't even use all of our brain power. So all of a sudden, we try to take an incomparable God who has no beginning, who has no end, who created the universe before we even thought of anything, and we try to bring him down to our level so that we might understand him. We've gotten ourselves in a lot of trouble over the centuries doing this. 
when we try to understand God and we try to find that God element, you know, in Europe, they're trying to make that machine that, that creates that new element that, that's the God element. You know, and they say, well, you know, show me God in science and I'll believe. Yeah, you know what? Let me tell you something. God is all over science, but God is not defined by science. He is not limited by science. You know, water is H2O. But if God wants water to be NaCl, which is salt, God will make water NaCl because God is not defined by science. Yet you can find God in science. So we as men in religion, we try to bring God down to our level so that we can understand him. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you get religions. You get branches of this. Well, God told me this. The end of the world is on this day, so forth and so on. And now all of a sudden, you get religion. People look at you and say, hypocrite. Because now you're operating in the flesh. Now you're operating in the, in the man. Because you're bringing God who is in, in, incomparable, who is not limited by time, not limited by mental power, not limited by finances or money or elements or science or any other thought that we can think of. We bring him down to our level and put him in our confinements and say, well, if God can, can live in this and this, then I'll believe. And we bring God down to our level. That's religion. Let me tell you something. Relationship lifts men towards God. I mean, do you get that? Did you hear that? Hello. We either bring God down to our level, and then we, when we do so, we find ourselves in error, or we lift ourselves through our relationship with Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit up to God's level and surpass the understanding of what mankind says. Because now all of a sudden we're not operating based upon the laws and the physics of man. Now we're operating based upon the laws and physics of God. Because of our personal Lord and Savior, because of our personal relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. I'll show you that. In Matthew, the 16th chapter, continuing on in that story, in the 8th verse, Jesus says, or it says, but Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, he's already, he know, it didn't say that they said to Jesus, it's because we didn't bring bread. They're talking amongst themselves and Jesus is keen to what they're saying. And Jesus said, being aware of it, says, take heed, where am I at? Verse number eight. Oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves? Because you have brought no bread? Don't you understand or remember the five loaves for the 5,000? How many baskets you took up? Nor the seven loaves for the 4,000. How many large baskets you took up? How is it that you don't understand that I didn't speak to you concerning bread, Jesus tells them, but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Verse number 12. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Jesus Christ says, listen, don't you know? I'm not talking about bread. Didn't you see me multiply it? Don't you know that I am not bound by one loaf of bread that you forgot to bring? He says, I wasn't talking about that. I'm talking about things above your head, but let me bring you up to understanding. And he brought them, he lifted them up to God's understanding. And now all of a sudden, bing, hello, they got it. Amazing. When we, when we live in a relationship with God through the Holy Spirit, you know what the Holy Spirit is that, is that, that of God that, that inspired the word of God to be written and penned. Let me tell you something. That same inspiration through the Holy Spirit that inspired the word of God to be written can inspire you and I to understand the word of God that was written so that we might know and be lifted up to God's level. But let me tell you this. You don't get that because you know who or about the Holy Spirit. You get that because you know the Holy Spirit. Speaking about relationship versus religion. You guys with me tonight? You guys still here tonight? I know it's Sunday night. Y'all thinking about Monday, but come on. We got to grab a hold of this. Because if we live in, especially this point, guys, if you live and grab, if you don't grab a hold of this, you're going to live and wonder why. God, why is it that I'm not getting this? Why is it that I'm not understanding? Because you know what? You're trying to bring God down to you. Remember the story of Job? Job begins to complain at the, end of the, at, the end of the, at the end of the book of Job, and God says, were you there when I created the universe? Were you there when I held it in my hand? In the book of Romans, Paul the Apostle talks about the, the, the nation of Israel, and he says at the end of, of the seventh chapter, he says, 
11th chapter. He says, who can counsel God? Who Did God bring you up to heaven to ask you, what do you think about this? No, but when you know God, when you know the Holy Spirit, when you have a relationship with God, the Holy Spirit that inspired the Word of God, that inspired Paul the Apostle, probably the most religious person we know, to write as much as he wrote, as deep as he wrote, he can inspire you and I to understand and to be up, bring, brought ourselves up to his level, but only through the relationship, not the religion. Did you guys get that? Are you guys getting that? I got one more tonight. I got one more. Are you guys okay on this? We're talking about religion versus relationship. Last one for tonight. Religion focuses on legalism. The law, the rules. Religion focuses on legalism. If you've got your Bibles, let's turn to Luke, the sixth chapter. So let's turn over a couple pages to, the, to, to Luke, the sixth chapter. Let me give you, while you're turning the pages, let me give you a little bit of background as, we're, as you're turning. Let me tell you something about this. We're going to talk about the sixth and seventh verse here. The Pharisees and the Sadducees are watching Jesus and his disciples. And in this story... They are walking through a grain field on the Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath in Jewish tradition, in Jewish law, was a day of rest. You weren't allowed to work. You weren't allowed to... You, 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 listen, man, you kick back on the Sabbath, okay? So the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes are watching Jesus and his disciples in the beginning of the verse. They said the disciples are walking through the grain field. And they pick a piece of grain. And they get mad. They're like, ah! They're picking grain on the Sabbath. I mean, talk about legalism. Hello. So Jesus says, Look, dude, come on, man. Didn't you know that David, when he was hungry, went into the temple of God and ate the bread that was unlawful for him to eat? And he gave it to the people that were with him. It's bread. It's food. So anyways, you can see there's a first example now in Luke, the sixth chapter. Again, it says on the sixth verse, now it happened on another Sabbath. That also he entered the synagogue and taught. And a man was there whose right hand was withered. So the scribes and the Pharisees watched him closely whether he would heal on the Sabbath that they might find an accusation against him. Now here you can see the religion, the legalists, those who are focused upon the law, those who are focused upon the rules and regulations of our life, the rules and things are, this is how things are done, this is how tradition says it. They're looking at him saying, man, if this guy heals somebody on the Sabbath, we're going to accuse him. What's worse than healing somebody on the Sabbath, or on Sunday, or Monday, or Tuesday, or Wednesday. But yet they're so focused on the rules, they're so focused on the tradition, they're so focused on what it says that they miss the point. They miss the idea. They miss the concept that here is the Son of God that came to this world to die for them while they accused him. And here they're trying to find reasons to bring him to justice, to bring him to accusations. Why? Because a guy's got a withered hand and he's preaching in the Sabbath. Religion focuses on legalism. This is the one that I think that a lot of us, you and I, when it comes to somebody else doing something, maybe it's not something that we disagree with or something like that. This is probably the one that we say, Psh, man, the Bible says they shouldn't do that. Ugh. Psh. Psh. They're going to get judged. This is where we operate in religion. You know, as a matter of fact, Jesus addresses this. Jesus says, hey, man, you, you want to get that speck out of your neighbor's eye, oh, you got a little something in your eye. He says, remove the plank out of your own eye first so that you can see better. Religion focuses on the law. You might have this big old plank sticking out of your eye. Just imagine this piece of wood sticking out of your eye. You're saying, dude, you got a little something in your eye. Let me try to get that for you. He says, that's what you look like when you focus on the law, when you focus on the rules, when you focus on the tradition. Here, that's what Jesus is saying. These, here's these Sadducees and these, these Pharisees in the, in, the, in the synagogue as Jesus is about to heal this person's hand, and they got a big old beam sticking out of their eye. He says, dude, do you know how you look? Because you're focusing on legalism. You're focusing on the rules. You're focusing on regulation. You're focusing on this rather than focusing on your relationship with God. Amen. Let me show you what the relationship says. Relationship focuses on truth. Did you get that? Legalism versus truth. A relationship with God focuses on truth because you know what? I'm not discounting the law. We're going to get to that in just a second. The law is important. 
The law was written for you and I so that we might live according to the word of God. So let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater here. But the truth overrides what the law says. And when we have a relationship with God, we know the truth. Let me show you as we continue on in that story in Luke, the sixth chapter, verse number eight. Jesus says, says, but he knew their thoughts. He knew what they were doing. He knew they were watching him closely. He's looking at them out of the corner of his eye saying, watch this. And he says to them, I'll ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath for, to do good or to do evil? To save a life or to destroy? And when he had looked around them all, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he did so. And as he was restored, his hand was restored as whole as the other. And they were filled with rage and discussed with one another that they might do to Jesus. They're so focused on the law. They're so focused on the Sabbath that Jesus asks them a question. Listen, let me ask you, is it lawful to do good or bad? To, to save a life or to destroy a life? Silence is his answer. So he says to the man, stretch out your hand. And all of a sudden this withered hand is made new like the other one. Miracle! You would think that they'd be like, oh, I don't see Beelzebub, you know, restoring hands. So maybe we should talk about this in, you know, in private and let's, let's, let's discuss this. But no, now they say, no, oh, oh my gosh, he healed on the Sabbath. And they're so distraught about what he did. But rather here Jesus says, here's the truth of the matter. This guy's got a withered hand. Oh, I'm the son of God. Reach out your hand. Boom. Now you know that I'm God. Go and follow me. What's the truth? The truth of the matter is, is you know what? We are children of God. And when we have a personal relationship with God, the law is important. But the truth of Jesus Christ, what Jesus Christ said, you know what? He didn't come, you know, so that we might find death and destruction. He kind of came that we find, might find life and find it more abundantly. But let me tell you something. It's important that we know the truth, the truth of God, the truth that Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, that God the Father came, that there was a sacrifice made for you and I. That we have the ability, we have the right, we have the, the, the ability to go before God now, approach the God. It doesn't matter if it's the Sabbath, it doesn't matter if it's a Sunday, it doesn't matter if it's a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. It doesn't matter if it's six in the morning or two at night. Yes, amen. We can go before God, we can approach God because now we know the truth. Right. We are children and heirs of God. Amen. Jesus Christ said, through the power of the Holy Spirit, a relationship with God that when he leaves, you and I would do greater things than he did, he did on this planet. That's the truth. Amen. It's not through religion that we're going to accomplish that church. We're not going to go out there because we know about God, because we know about Jesus Christ, and accomplish greater than Jesus. But when we know the Holy Spirit, when we have a relationship with Jesus Christ in our hearts, when we are filled with the Spirit of God, and we know God, now all of a sudden we got a divine connection and now that power that was in Jesus is in us through God. Are you guys with me tonight? In wrapping it up, religious, religion can get us into trouble, but so can living outside of religion. So can going to that other ditch. That's why I showed that picture. We don't want to get so focused on not being legalist that we go so far to the other side and say, well, God's grace will cover me in anything I do. God loves me. He wouldn't send me to hell. Let me tell you something, God will love you all the way there. Yeah, that's right. So let's not get stuck in one ditch and swerve to the other and continue that through our life. But rather, church, let's move through that narrow passageway that Jesus Christ talked about. Let's live on that passageway. And how do we accomplish that? By a personal relationship with our Lord and Savior, by a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit, by hearing the words of God in our life. Paul the Apostle talks about the law in Romans, the seventh chapter. And he says in Romans, the seventh chapter, he's talking about freedom from the law and, and how the letter gives, uh, how the letter brings life, but the spirit gives, uh, the letter brings death, but the spirit gives life. And here, Paul the Apostle in Romans, the seventh chapter, in the seventh verse, he says, you know what? It's not that the law is bad. The law is good. Because he, Paul the Apostle uses this example. He says, without the law, I wouldn't know about sin because I would be oblivious to it. That's the bottom line, churches. The law, that's why I say legalism. You've got to be careful that you don't discount the law. 
and get into the non-religious side of that ditch. Because the law is good. Why? Because the law shows us things that we're supposed to do. But through the flesh, through the sin, now all of a sudden we've been made aware, Paul says. Of, he says, I've been made aware of covetousness. Now all of a sudden sin steps in within me and exploits that. And now all of a sudden the law becomes something that brings death. Because in the times of Jesus Christ, the law of our sin, the consequences of the style of the actions of our life would brought, would brought us to death. But you know what the Bible tells us in the very next chapter of Romans, the 8th chapter, the first verse, he says, in Christ there is no condemnation. Why? Because Jesus Christ died for us in that while we were still sinners. Now all of a sudden there is no condemnation in the law. The law bring, may have brought death, but because Jesus Christ laid his life down upon that cross, he made a new covenant with us saying, listen, you know what? I'm going to wipe away that sentence of death on your life because I have paid it in full. And now the law can show you how to live, but the relationship with Jesus Christ is what will keep you going that way. You guys get something out of that tonight? Praise God. So remember this week as you go about relationship versus religion. And in our actions, as we want to rise up, if we want to point out about that speck in somebody else's eye, remember, before you open your mouth, Wipe your eye to see, do I have a plank sticking out? And let's not focus so much on religion, but rather let's focus upon our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Excellent. Amen? Yes. Listen, I want to do something. I'm going to do a little bit out of order here. I want to ask everybody, please, church isn't out. We're not done yet. I'm talking about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about it right now. So I want to ask you guys, you've only been in church for an hour and five minutes. Please remain seated. I want to ask you a question in this place tonight. If you were to leave this place tonight and you were to die, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? I want you to answer that within your heart. You say, oh, Pastor Luke, you know, that's a pretty, pretty blunt question. You know, what does that have to do with tonight? Let me ask you. Examine that. Let's go over some of those answers. You know, it's an important question. It would be a shame for us to have the service tonight and talk about a personal relationship Religion versus relationship and not give you the opportunity to understand and to see and compare what you think a relationship is versus what the Bible says. If you were to leave this place tonight and you were to die, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? Well, let's go over some of those answers maybe some of you might have had in this place. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, if I leave this place tonight, I hope, I think I get to heaven. Can you show me where it says in the Bible that because you hope you're going to get to heaven, that you're going to find yourself there, that you're going to get a, a relationship with God because you hope so? Because you think that you're going to get to heaven, that you're going to find your way there? Can you show me where it says that in the Bible? Nowhere in the Bible will you find that because you hope or think that you're going to get into heaven, you're going to get there. Just because you hope or think doesn't mean you have a, the most positive outlook on life doesn't mean that you're going to find your way into heaven. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't born as a Hindu or as a Muslim or, or anything of that, of that nature. I'm in no other world religion or philosophical thought. So doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me in the Bible where it says it? Because you're not a Buddhist, a Hindu, or a Muslim, or any other type of world religion that you're going to find your way into heaven. Can you show me where it says that? Nowhere in the Bible. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, you know... I don't believe that heaven exists. I don't believe that hell exists. I read a survey or I read a report that said that the growing majority of young Americans are indifferent to heaven and hell. Don't even care. Don't even believe it. Let me tell you something. Whether you care it exists, whether you believe it exists, heaven is a real place. Hell is a real place. And it's time for us to stop playing games. It's time for somebody to love you enough to tell you the truth that hell is a very real place. Heaven is a very real place. The Bible talks about it. Jesus speaks about it. It's important enough for him to say something about it. It's important enough for you and I to realize that it's true. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, you know, I was born in America. My money says in God we trust. So doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says in the word of God because you were born in America because America was supposedly a Christian nation that you're going to get your way in heaven? Can you show me where it says that? Can you show me that because you call yourself a Christian, because maybe your parents took you to Sunday school, Sabbath school, or catechism classes as a child. Maybe they baptized you, blew smoke and water over you as a child. Can you show me that because of that, in the word of God, that you're going to find your way to heaven? Can you show me where it says that? Nowhere. Because you call yourself, because you give yourself a name, because you gave yourself a title. I'm a Christian. Does that mean that you're going to get into heaven? Nowhere does it, does it show you that. As a matter of fact, that's what we call religion. You know about God, but you don't know God. 
You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, you know, I was an usher in my last church. I carried the pastor's Bible. I sang in the choir. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? You know, I have a card in my wallet that says I'm a member to the church. I come to church. I sit in services. I'm here Christmas and on, on Easter, and I'm here tonight. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to find my way into heaven? Can you show me in the Word of God where it says it because you sit in service? that you're going to get your way in heaven because you got a card in your wallet that says you're a member to a church because you carry the pastor's Bible or you're an usher or you sing in the choir. Guys, let me tell you something and let me, let me love you enough to tell you the honest truth. It's just not that way. And yet for so many reasons we believe that. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, I'm a good person. I don't cheat on my taxes. I, don't, I, drive, I drive the speed limit. You know, I give to charitable organizations. I help to fight world hunger. I've never robbed a bank or 7-Eleven. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get in heaven? Good people don't go to hell, Pastor Luke. Can you show me where it says that? Can you show me where it says that because of your good deeds, because of your good lifestyle, because of the decisions that you've made, because you give to charitable organizations, because you pay your taxes, that you're going to get your way in heaven? Can you show me where it says that in the word of God? Nowhere will you find that. It's not about our actions. The Bible says that our actions, according to God, are, are like filthy rags. Nothing you and I can do will ever get us to heaven on our own. A man by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus in John the third chapter and he asks Jesus, Jesus, what must I do to get into heaven? Nicodemus was a, was, was a Pharisee of his church. He was, he was the pastor of his church. You know, Nicodemus was a religious ruler. Because he was a religi religious ruler, he had, he had dedicated his young life to memorizing the scripture, to studying the word of God. Nicodemus could quote the scripture. He could sing the scripture. He did all the right things. He said all the right things. Wore the right clothes. It was based upon the external. And Jesus Christ says to Nicodemus, and he says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. What does born again mean? Let me tell you, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, born again has always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. Jesus Christ speaking to the church in the book of Revelation, speaking to people like you and I, sitting here, hearing the word of God, knowing about God. He says, listen, I know your works. When I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Pastor Luke, that's pretty vulgar. I can't believe you'd say something like that. What does that mean? Jesus Christ says, listen, when it comes time for you to meet your maker, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will spit you out. I will reject you out of the kingdom of God. Don't be deceived in this place tonight. God's not a manipulator. God's not a conniver. I'm not up here trying to sell you something, trying to show you that, you know what, based upon what you might think, you're not going to get into heaven. The only way you're going to get there is through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You might say, Pastor Luke, I know the stories of Moses and of Jonah and of Jesus. I know about Jesus. I know him. Let me tell you something. Hey, everybody, look at me. God's not after your mental ascent towards him. He's after your heart. He's after all of your life. He's after a personal relationship so that you stop operating in religion and you start operating in a relationship with him. I love you enough. I respect you enough. I honor you enough tonight. Up here, it's not care what you think, but to tell you the truth so that you might develop a personal relationship with God. You say, hey, well, Pastor Luke, I'd love to do that. How do we do that? Let me tell you something. Let's not do it your way tonight. Let's not do it my way. Tonight in this house, let's do it God's way. Well, what is God's way? Let me tell you something. Jesus says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. And if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. Jesus Christ said that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by him. Church, here's the bottom line. Nothing you do, no other way can you get to heaven. No other philosophical thought, no other type of religion or anything like that, but only way to get there is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And he said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. In a moment, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, three. I'm going to go bang. I'm going to smack my hand on my Bible just like that. Bang. If that's you in this house, you know you've never given Jesus Christ all of your heart, all of your life. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to, you can pop your hand up. If you're not sure in this, in this place tonight, I want you to pop your hand up when I slap my hand on the Bible. You know what? Don't leave this place tonight without making sure the Bible says that, don't, that tomorrow isn't promised. Our life is but a vapor. Don't leave this place tonight being deceived. Don't leave this place tonight operating in religion, but leave this place tonight operating in a relationship. If you've been living lukewarm, what is lukewarm? Let me tell you what lukewarm is. 
It's a little bit in, it's a little bit out, a little bit up, a little bit down. Maybe you got a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck, occasional church attendance. You're doing some of your own thing, doing some of God's thing. You're riding the fence, so we say. You got too much of God in you to enjoy the world. You got too much of the world in you to enjoy God. If that's you in this place, in a moment, I also want you to pop your hand up. You say, Pastor Luke, if I put my hand up, somebody's going to see me and I'm going to be embarrassed. You know what? I'm not going to embarrass you if you put your hand up. And even if you were embarrassed because you put your hand up and somebody saw you, wouldn't it be better to be embarrassed for a moment than to spend an eternity in hell? The decision is yours tonight. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way in. You have got to invite him. You have got to want him. You have got to want a relationship, not a religion. All across this auditorium, all at the same time, hands are getting ready to go up. If that's you in this place, don't leave without making sure. If you've never given all your heart, let's do it tonight. Let's make it the night. Tonight, you go forward for God. If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, tonight, let's make it the night you go forward for God. You're floating down a river and your boat's pointed up the right way, but you're still going backwards. Let's get you turned around and going for God. Don't worry about what people think about. Remember, religion worries about the external. Religion worries about the approval of man. But tonight, it's not about religion. It's about the approval of God. It's about the inside. If that's you in this place, in a moment, I'm going to count to three. I just want you to pop your hand. One, two, three. That's you. Got you, brother. One. So you just pop your hand up so I can see it. I see people pointing. Where are you at? Two, brother, I got you. Three, four, I got you. Anybody else in this place? Four people in this house. Anybody else? I see it. Where are you at? Five, I see you, brother. Five wise people. That's you in this place. Anybody else? I see you pointing. Where are you guys at? Where are you pointing to me? Keep leading me. Ah, oh, got you. Six, seven. Praise God. Seven wise people. Where are you at? I see somebody else. Eight, I got you, sister. Eight wise people. If you know there's eight, you know there's ten. Where are you, nine and ten? If that's you in this place, got your brother. Nine. Where are you, number ten? Lord, speaking to you, saying, man, I wish maybe this guy would shut up. <laughs> got you, sister. Ten. Anybody else across this place tonight? If that's you. Don't make religion your life. Make a personal relationship, if that's you. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. If that's you in this place. Go and pop your hand up just so I can see it. Let's move forward with God tonight. Let's go with a relationship. Anybody else? Ten wise people. Praise God for ten wise people. Hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. Well, let me tell you something. I want to do something. In a moment, I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. If you've raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, I want you to do something. I want you to be bold. You said you were going to give Jesus Christ all of your heart, all of your life. You don't get saved by just raising your hand. You get saved by accepting him into your heart. Let us help you with that tonight. I'm going to ask you in a moment, as everybody stands, in just a moment, as everybody stands, I'm going to ask you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend, and I want you to come and meet me up here. You said you were going to give Jesus Christ all of your heart, all of your life. You said it. Let us help you tonight. Let us pray with you in the house tonight. If that's you, I want to go ahead and ask everybody to stand. And if you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, I want you to come and meet me up here tonight. Let's meet me up here tonight. You can come. Lord, I give you my heart. You can come. I give you my soul. Come on down. Come on down. They're coming. They're coming. Welcome. Welcome. Every breath that I take, every moment. They're still coming. They're still coming. Come on, guys. Welcome, welcome. They're coming. They're coming. You can come too. It's not too late. Welcome, welcome. Well, hey, guys, here's what I want you to do. You know, you don't get saved by just raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart, to come into your life. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to introduce to you a friend of mine right over here. This is Pastor Dave Simmons. You thought, man, Pastor Luke, maybe you're a pretty cool guy. Nah, it's not where it's at. This is where it's at. He's going to take you just right over there. Nothing weird goes on. All he's going to do is he's going to pray with you. 
He's going to give you some free stuff. A book that our pastor wrote, you know, You Just Got Saved, Welcome to Your Destiny, it's called. You Just Got Saved is going to give you some super easy reading of, you know, now where do I go? How do I, what do I do so I don't go back to the junk that I came from? So I don't go back to the religion, but now I maintain a relationship. He's going to give you a book. He's going to also introduce to you what we have here at the church called Spiritual Personal Trainers. You know, like when you go to the gym and you see the personal trainers, those guys that are helping somebody lift weights and making sure that they eat right? We're going to introduce to you a friend, somebody here that will, that will call you during the week and make sure that you're getting the word of God. They're going to meet with you five times before our service. You can, you can do it with a friend or whatever it might be. They're going to meet with you and teach you some basic principles to get you strong in the things of God so that you don't go back to the junk. You don't go back to the religion of your life, but you go into that relationship and you maintain a strong and healthy relationship. So if you guys would just go right over there to your left, my right with Pastor Dave. Praise God.